Do you hear that? Do you hear that turkey? Up the hill right there. I just wanted to show you guys this uh, turkey wing bone call. These are made from two of the wing bones, not the very tip part, you know, the really pointy part of a bird wing, but the other two joints, you use the bones in, in those two joints. They work real well. I've, um, this is the second turkey I've got this year. If I had to guess, I'd say maybe 60 or 70% of my turkeys are called in with one of these. It probably works like if I'm near a turkey like this one, if I walk up the hill kind of nearby and stake out a good hiding spot and start squawking, I'd say about 40% of the time maybe they'll come. Uh, some of the time they'll just sit there and they won't move and other times it spooks them and they run away. I'm sure it sounds a little weird to them. They're, pro they're probably like, what's that? Is that, a, is that a hen or isn't it a hen? And they're curious. Anyway, they're probably, he's probably thinking, she sounds weird, I bet she's a freak. <laughs> I'm gonna get me some of that and uh, on down the hill. I'm not very good at it, actually. If you got some turkey recordings or spent a lot of time around turkeys, you can definitely dial it in to sound more and more like a turkey. For me, I just find that if I make some turkey-like noises, it usually works pretty good. And then also they do like subtle sounds and you can do that too to get them kind of entice them in a little closer. It works remarkably well, and it's a lot of fun, and they're real easy to make. The shot on this one literally knocked me on my ass because I staked out a great spot, and sometimes I'll get into like a small fir tree, and there's always limbs in the way, like growing down to the ground, and I, I kind of like nick them and push them over into one side to, or to both sides and form like a screen, right? So all the limbs are kind of like pushed into a wall. I called him in and he came down where I thought he would, but then he, he veered off and he started circling because he was suspicious, right? I managed to quietly like and slowly get the gun around the, the tree and I was like this. And by the time I got over here, the shotgun butt was like into my arm instead of my shoulder. I knew I didn't have a good seat, but I just had, you know, I saw his head and I wasn't gonna like mess around because he could get spooked any time and so I pulled the trigger and it literally knocked me on my ass. My arm's gonna be sore but <laughs> it's not like I was gonna let that shot go just to not have a sore arm. Real simple. It's sort of a poetic injustice that you can make a turkey call from a turkey wing bone and call a turkey in and kill it, but it's true. Uh, not only do these work, but they actually work quite well. This is the first one I got from my old buddy, uh, Rob Withrow. Shout out to Rob Withrow, wherever he is out there. And there's someone else's name on it, so I think he probably actually traded for this. And when I moved here, there's a lot of turkeys here, and I started using this regularly, and uh, I've been using them real regular ever since. This is one that I made from one of my turkeys that I shot, and I'm going to show you how to make one. You don't want to cook the bones for too long. I would keep it under an hour if you can. Scrape most of the meat off, you know, all this stuff that we don't want off the part that we're actually going to use, which you'll see in a minute. Well, these are them right here. And I'll show you where these bones are located in just a minute. Any knife will work for this. It doesn't even have to be that sharp. Just grab a whatever's handy, kitchen knife, or not a serrated knife, obviously. I throw that stuff to the chickens. The turkey wing looks, what, something like, I can't remember which way everything bends. Uh, you don't need this part, the wing tip. This part has two bones in it right here. You need those two and this bone right here. This is a you know right and left here, so it doesn't look exactly the same. But you can get the idea here. We're going to cut it down here, you know, somewhere in this area. Just maybe leave a little bit of this depression right there, like a quarter inch of that. And then up here, you're going to have this kind of big divot thing. But you can't cut that out. You have to cut it up here to leave enough to make the trumpet. If anything, cut them a little large. So we'll cut that one there. And cut about like this. This is a bit awkward. There we go. These are very, very thin 
fragile bones, so try to go easy on them at the end of the cut so you don't splinter something off. They're real easy to clean up by scraping. The only thing you're really going to have trouble with um, significantly is getting in here, but just use the belly of a knife like this and use your thumb for pressure here and just dig right in there and scrape it out. There we go. The larger end of this is going to go in here so we can take a look at that and kind of get an idea. It starts to swell out here at some point a little bit so we can cut it where it starts to swell out. But you do want to be careful about you know, cutting it too short, too quick, because once you cut it, you're stuck with it. All right, there's going to be some, you know, marrow in here. You can blow on it, run water through it. You know, you can do all kinds of stuff, but you, you really do need to get in here with something and push the stuff out. This actually got dried out. And once we get in here and cook this again, we're going to cook it with a little bit of soap to try to get the bone real clean, get some of the oil out of the bone. Should be able to get it pretty clean. So by hook or by crook, whatever you can manage, uh, you know, maybe a little really thin twig in here, piece of wire or something like that. But this bone is pretty hollow. Like there's, there's not much in this one. Okay, this one has these uh, bony parts in here like that. You can often just kind of carve that stuff out with the tip of a knife like this. You know, this is a little hard on knives in terms of being hard on the edge, but it's really not a big deal in terms of like damaging the knife unless it's ground way too thin or you misuse it and, you know, try to pry too much. But these are just, this is a normal type of a task for a knife to me. So you can see there's a sort of hum honeycomb stuff in here. Let me get rid of that. If you want to go high tech, you can use Dremel. You know, a Fordham tool, but you can do a good enough job with a knife. Basically, that's it. Just just dig it out and carve that stuff out. This is a lot more brittle, but it it's actually breaking instead of cutting, which I don't know. Maybe that's just as well because it's kind of going pretty easy. They usually do them when they're fresh out of the pot. Be, just be real careful whatever you use about prying against the side of this. It's a lot stronger from the, this side, the concave side, just like an egg, right? It's easy to break out of an egg, but it, the egg itself is pretty tough because of this radius right here. So just be real careful not prying. Even when you're fitting them together, you don't fit them too tight and don't pry like that or you'll bust the side out. Okay, this is boring, so I'll see you when I get this clean enough to proceed. That is still much too large to fit in there. This swells up quite a bit, so I'm gonna cut it back here with that swell. Starts. Could take a bit of that off too. Okay, that's gonna have to do. It's starting to fit now, but I'm gonna take some of uh, off right here and right here. Now the fit is never, it's never very good. So don't expect it to be a great fit, but that's in there. That's a, a full three eighths of an inch. And we're just gonna manage this space in, in a minute here, make that work. But overall, I'm liking that fit. And that's the final fit there. I'm gonna say that's a good fit. Yeah, I'm happy with that. Uh, most glues shrink. So hide glue shrinks, carpenter's glue shrinks. What doesn't shrink is epoxy. Fill all this space and it'll just sit there and it'll harden without shrinking. But I'm not gonna use epoxy. I would normally use hide glue. This one was done with hide glue and there's, you know, this joint's a little loose and this joint's a little loose, but it works and it's, it's uh, okay. And the way I did that is I used wood flour mixed with the glue. So I'm gonna make some wood flour. Let's see. I think the rasp, rasp, rasp side of this is good. Maybe we'll mix it up and make a little bit of fine powder too, more like wood flour. So what does this do? It provides a filler so that the space that we're filling is a bunch of wood 
with um, a small amount of glue. And if we mix it while well, the glue should be touching every surface of every piece of this wood flower, and therefore the glue will shrink, but the wood won't shrink, at least not much. Okay, so, and what I'm gonna use today is I'm, instead of using my usual hide glue, I'm gonna use regular carpenter's glue because I know everybody can get this. A lot of people have it already, and I think it'll work, so. And I have no clue how much to use of both. I'm just making this up as I go. I have a feeling that was a little too much glue. I feel like we should have a little bit more. That feels better. And I think that's gonna stiffen up a little more as the glue soaks into the wood fiber. So I have a piece of uh, oak here and I'm gonna just take some splinters off of it, use those to help fill in the extra space. prime these surfaces with glue. I would do this with high glue as well, except with high glue, I would use it hot and I would smear it in here. And then once the whole joint was put together, I would reheat the entire joint because then the glue would flow. Maybe you don't know how high glue works and I don't want to explain it right now, but I have lots of videos on high glue. These surfaces are primed, so I'm just trying to make sure that I get a good bond. It's going to end up like this. So I'm going to push it this way and I'm going to pack a bunch of this stuff right down in there. Oh yeah, this feels great. Push that down as long as I don't push it all the way out. Also shove this splinter of wood in here a little bit. And then I'm gonna bend this and it's gonna pack all that stuff in there. That seemed to go pretty good. Just get that. Just push and keep pushing a little bit extra in there. Looks good. You prime this with glue a little bit and then shove that down in there as far as it will go. And now I'm just gonna look around for anywhere that this might move or I think I could get another splinter down in there. Maybe I'll just use this piece of popsicle stick Yep, right there. Get that in there. <clears throat> Bust that off, and then I think we're I think we're good. So, I'm gonna score this. And trim off the extra. So I just want to check this. I'm gonna get it nice and clean. There's a little hole right there. I'm just gonna shove that splinter down in there. Take a little pack a little of this in there. I think this is probably going to work pretty good. I, I really don't think this is going to shrink very much. If it doesn't shrink too much, all the glue bonds will stay intact. The splinters will be glued to the sides of the, the thing and to the sawdust, and the sawdust will stay glued to the side of the bonds. See, if it shrinks enough, though, some of them will pull away and break. And I don't think I did this good of a job on the last high glue one I did. Now, or even after the glue dries, we can just use a knife like this and scrape it off. Okay, so you get the idea. I'm just gonna do the same thing right here. There's another call you can make with a splinter of bone and a piece of slate. And I haven't made one of those yet, but my friend Wiley has made one and he says they work. So that's definitely on the agenda because I have tons of slate here, tons and tons from doing slate roofs. Although I'm, you know, I'm pretty happy with these too. Nice and tight, well, hopefully it'll stay that way. One thing you could do uh, that I, I probably should have done, I just didn't think of it, is to round these a little bit. You know, just sand them around like I did here. It just makes the whole thing more finished and more more smooth, like it's not gonna catch on stuff in your pocket and all that. But I can still do that with a file and a, maybe a little bit of sandpaper or a piece of sandstone or something like that. But otherwise, that's it. I mean, I don't even have to wait for it to dry to start using it. It's actually very tight. I'll show you how to use this in a minute. But first, we're going to talk about how to get these bones really clean. All right, so these bones, you know, they sat around for a while. Like I, I had, you know, the soup that I made and I ate the soup and then I set these aside and forgot about them and they actually dried out. So this has some dried gunk in there that I still need to get out. Um, but you also see how this bone is kind of yellowish and 
say this one here is real, real white, and this one's fairly white, that's oil from the marrow. So the oil from the inside, as the bone dried, kind of soaked in and replaced the water in the bone. It's uh, kind of nice to get stuff really, you know, shiny and, and nice like this. So what you can do is basically cook it in soapy water. Any kind of soap, like a some kind of detergent, like dish soap or laundry detergent, it, but don't cook them for too long and then take them out and dry them and see how they look. If it's not done to your satisfaction, you could try doing it again. But again, the more you cook the bone, the more you're cooking out some of the stuff that makes the bone strong. A bone is not just a chunk of calcium, as a lot of people think, because we're always told, you know, we need calcium to build healthy bones. They're also full of all kinds of other minerals, phosphorus, and more importantly, a water-soluble protein. So that protein helps hold the whole structure of the bone together. If you just boil it in water too long, you'll start to lose some of the substance of the bone and eventually becomes more brittle. Okay, so after that, you know, it'll probably be pretty white, but if you really want to bleach it, like you might have some of this darkness here where there's marrow and stuff, just regular 3% hydrogen peroxide. Cover the bones, let them sit overnight in a container, uh, 12 to 24 hours and you'll be surprised at uh, how much they can bleach out any of this darkness that's left and stuff like that. Work on this just a little bit more because I do want these really rounded and nice like this because it does make a big difference in handling, you know, putting it in and out of my pack or my pocket and stuff like that. So one thing I can use here is this is my Baco Farmer's file. I'm pretty fond of this file design. It's also called an axe file sometimes. It's a multi-use file. It has a double cut rough side, a finer single cut side. It has a safe edge with no teeth on it and it has an edge with teeth on it. But since we have an edge with no teeth on it, we can probably, hopefully, if we don't have to tip it at too much of an angle, we can use that to clean up this edge without marring this too much, is what I'm saying. I can still feel, I have to tip it you know, so much that this is still cutting. So get a piece of masking tape and mask this off with several layers so that when the file hits it, it won't damage that. Then I can work with relative impunity. Now, if you want to do that with more primitive tools, uh, you know, any chunk of sandstone or gritty stone would very, very quickly round these off for you. I should have probably used that just to just to do it. Just uh, go ahead and polish it up too, uh, like this, because this is just so nice. Uh, polished bone is such a great material. Instead of using sandpaper, let's go ahead and use equisetum. Equisetum is a horsetail, it's often called. It's a very, very primitive plant, very ancient plant. There's fo I've seen fossil horsetail stems that were like. I think about that big around, pretty huge. Probably back when there were giant dragonflies. Uh, this stuff makes great sandpaper. I just put down this little black piece of uh, paper so you can see the bone dust coming off of here. Uh, this will put a, a reasonable polish on here actually, but you know, if we want it super fine, we're gonna have to go to something finer. Yeah, don't doubt how effective this is. There's just a ton of silica in the stem. Silica being, of course, what quartz and glass are made from. You do want to use it sideways, though, and not too much this way, because if you use it this way, it'll actually just cut grooves, because these ridges will, will literally saw grooves into the, the surface. And this horse tail is ideal. It's been dried, but it's a little bit damp in here today, because I have all the windows open. It's been raining for two days. So it's still nice and flexible and it's not breaking apart. You see this little chip? Can you see that right there? That's what I was talking about when I was cutting from the inside and I pried just a little too much against the edge and it just chips real easy there. Now, if you wanted to polish this finer, some things you could try are smaller horsetail. Also taking like a piece of leather or cloth and putting a fine abrasive on it, maybe ashes, real fine ashes though, like if you're sure there's no grit or big pieces of anything in there, clay, you know, and kind of put those on a, on a piece of leather or something and use that to, to rub. This is just some dried out, smaller species of horsetail. It's like a different species, completely different species. So yeah, I don't want to spend much time on this right now, but one could certainly use this to get this a lot shinier. I'm not sure I can see well enough. 
to do this, just rub a little lamp black in here so I can see what's going on. This is going to look terrible. Yeah, it does. It looks pretty terrible. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to finish it like super fast. And if it looks good enough, I'm going to leave it. But it doesn't seem like it's going to, you know, as usual, this is turning into this thing. I'm like, oh, check this out. You can do this and this. But I'm going to show you one more thing. I'm going to go outside and I'm going to harvest some fir pitch. What this is, is a blister of pitch from a fir tree. So certain conifer trees will produce these blisters all over the trunk of the young trees and they contain this sap. You know, it's like pine pitch, but it's very liquid, this stuff right here. And we just need a tiny bit of that. This is something I figured out years ago when I was trying to etch some bones, I would rub ink, you know, or soot into the etching, but it wouldn't stick and I just couldn't get it to stay. I'd clean the bone off and all the pit, all the color would wipe out of the grooves. This is lamp black. If you watch my leather beer mug video, you'll see me making this, but we'll, I'll do a video on how to make lamp black sometime, but it's just soot. Uh, light a candle and then just take a plate or piece of metal or anything that doesn't burn and just hold it over the flame and just disrupt the flame just a little bit, like hold it right at the tip of the flame and it'll create a bunch of soot and the soot will stick. And if you do that for like, five seconds you'll have enough to do in etching like this. Uh, this is just a little bit of olive oil. I'm just going to dab a little bit on this rag here and start wiping this because that blister pitch, like all pitch, is oil soluble. And however it works, you know, enough of that pitch stays in the grooves and doesn't dissolve from the oil. Actually that's not that horrible. I mean, it's crude, but it's kind of kind of cool. It's like primitive art, right? It's fine if you look at it from 20 feet away. Turkey call and a bunch of cool new tricks you can play with. That horsetail got this bone plenty polished. Yeah, I hardly spent any time polishing it, so pretty cool. Okay, now the only thing that remains is to use it. Unfortunately, the mating season is pretty much over, so as far as us going out to actually use this in real life, that ain't gonna fly, but maybe tomorrow. I'll show you how to use it, and you could probably get better at it than I am. Did you hear that? Dude, there's a turkey outside close by. Unfortunately, the season's over, so I can't shoot him, but let's go make him make some noise. Okay, this is how this is gonna work, I hope. I'm gonna use this, and I haven't heard a turkey gobble for maybe as much as two weeks. And I'm in the trailer, and I tested this, and I heard one gobble outside. So that's one way that you can really use these, is just to, as a locator. Kind of figure out where he is, where he might naturally want to head, go scope out a spot where I can hide, and then start calling him in. Since we have our new turkey call and there's a turkey, we might as well call him in. Again, I can't shoot him because it's not turkey season, which is too bad because I already ate my last turkey. You guys be quiet. He's close. He's real close, so... I got to hightail it out before he makes it down somewhere where he's going to figure me out.
he's had it the other way. So he must be really suspicious. I noticed that sometimes you can only get him to respond with a really plaintive call. Like if you make it really loud and really urgent sounding and long, like that time it went a couple extra chirps long. And he, I finally got him to answer back, but he sounds further away than he was. So he's probably suspicious, but it, like, maybe if I just push the right buttons, you know, like if it's just so long or whatever, his uh, natural instincts are going to take over and he's going to gobble back. <clears throat> but it really is kind of on the tail end of the season. I, I kind of was thinking the season must be over because I haven't been hearing him or seeing him. But uh, I'm not going to spend any more time, you know, chasing him around. So sometimes they will only answer and they'll stay put. Sometimes they'll get spooked and run away, and sometimes they'll come to the call. And I'm sure there's a lot of times when they just don't answer at all, and that they are out there. And then sometimes they'll come, but then they're real suspicious, and like some of them are real cautious and other ones aren't. Some of them will just run, literally, I've had them literally running at me. And then some will, they'll often come close, and then they'll start to circle, and that's when you can get a shot. I use number four steel shot, and I always aim for the head. Even using like a, a rifle, like a 22 or something, they'll still uh, sometimes get away. If you shoot them in the body with small bird shot, there's a really, really good chance they're just going to fly away and you're never going to see them again. And then, you know, they're either going to die or they're going to carry around a bunch of lead shot for the rest of their life. And I also use my pellet rifle. It's a 22 caliber pellet rifle, very accurate. I can easily hit three quarter inch groups at, you know, 30 yards, except for the occasional bad pellet or something like that you know with a scope and i've shot lots and lots of turkeys with that again only head shots but the head you know the head brain area is bigger than an inch and i can get you know pretty consistent three quarter inch groups at 30 yards with that rifle that works i've got lots of them that way but the shotgun steel shot take head shots it's always easy to get head shots almost always unless they're literally flying away i just i don't shoot at them if they're flying away um i just only go for headshots, and if you can get a clear shot at the head with that number four, any shotgun with reasonable size pellets, they're going down for sure. It's the next day, and this is super solid. It dried really, really solid, and it was always solid. Even when I put it together, because I used those shims, it really locked everything in place, and even when the glue wasn't dry yet, you know, I was sanding it and filing it, and I took it out and used it. Never at any point was I extra careful with it, and it looks great. So I thought I'd just uh, throw some, you know, about basically show how to use it. I wouldn't consider myself good at this. I've never studied on it. I don't know the difference between one turkey sound and another. I just got one of these and I walked out and I used it and it worked and it's worked pretty well ever since. So I kind of lack the incentive to, uh, you know, improve my technique. Now, of course, that's here, and our hunting pressure is not that high. I mean, it is to some people in California, and there are a lot of turkeys, but uh, I would say that, you know, there's a lot of places where turkeys have been hunted a lot harder, a lot longer. They're probably more wary, I would guess, but here it's fairly easy to hunt turkeys, and they're not all that cautious. So the way this works is basically that you make an inward kissing sound with your lips, and you have the opening of this right, just right at the edge of the lips. And you can kind of move it in and out and change it to change the pitch a little bit. You can sometimes get a more reedy, harsh sound, which is really what a turkey hen sounds like. I mean, they, it's not a pleasant sound. That's one of the challenges, I think, is getting that real brash, uh, you know, sound out of it. So, for instance, if I put it, you know, further into my lips, like further inside my mouth, Still not very far. It can get like maybe a, a little deeper sound. And then if I put it right at the edge of my lip, I might even tip it down a little to get kind of partially block this so my lip is like vibrating against this. Anyway, you can just play with it and uh, it's really not that hard to use. It takes a little little getting used to. I'm always a little bit better at it by the end of turkey season. And uh, I don't think I have anything else to say. So thanks for watching and I will see you in some other video. Yeah, you can uh, just dry pluck these guys. There's no, no hot water necessary, which is real nice because dry plucking is much more pleasant than wet plucking. Wet plucking is 
yeah, not that much fun. Neither is dry plucking, honestly, but not my idea of fun. But it is uh, pretty easy with these wild turkeys, at least. I find if you don't let them cool off too much, unfortunately, I kind of let this one get a little cool. So there's one shot here. Looks like I got him kind of low. That shotgun is open. You know, it's not. there's no choke on it. I kind of want to get a choke for it because I'd rather have full choke. But that barrel was cut short, so it's open. For me, what I, what I use that gun for is almost just turkeys. So I don't hunt small birds or squirrels. I won't, I won't hunt them with a shotgun because it just hammers the meat. I use my pellet rifle for those things. Squirrels and quail, basically. And that's what I got here. Squirrels, quail, turkey. There's jackrabbits around on the ranch, but they don't like this property for some reason. They're never here. Um, there's not very many bunny rabbits, or like small rabbits. There's a few, but you don't see them very often. Not really any here on the property again. I just shoot turkeys in the head with it. That's its job.